Mr. Clark's back. Hope everybody's doing well. It's time for us to take a look at the Roosevelt Hoover matchup as two presidents put forth their ideas on how to deal with the Great Depression. As we move forward today, we're going to evaluate Hoover's approach and how Americans react to that. And we're going to contrast that with Franklin Roosevelt's approach to the Great Depression. As we move forward, make sure you're filling out your focus questions. If you want to watch the recorded lesson on a secondary device, that might be a good idea. That way you can answer out your questions on your Chromebook. All right, so as we move forward, kind of keep in mind that President Hoover is a Republican. He's going to push forward with traditional conservative ideas for the economy. Whereas Franklin Roosevelt's going to be a traditional liberal and somebody who really ushers in some of the earliest uh, ideas and some of the ideas that we still have today that uh, most liberals kind of embrace. All right, so when you look at the economic business cycles, it's always important to understand that the United States economy and most economists believe the American economy and the world economy for that matter, you know, follows a basic cycle, a period of growth followed by contraction which are kind of naturally occurring business cycles. Knowing this, businesses and individuals can better make financial decisions. Now, President Hoover was a big advocate of the business cycle as we move into number two. He believed, as well as his advisors believed, the United States economy had entered a negative economic business cycle and was going to naturally bounce back. So as a result, Hoover was relatively slow to react to the challenges of the depression. And as a result, the depression continued to worsen. One thing that conservatives in general, and it's always important to kind of look at the issues we discuss from a more broad perspective, not just in the lens of the 1920s or 30s, but also in the context of modern day society. So when we look at localism, this is basically the idea that the federal government should not intervene in the economy. And that is, you know, you can see in modern day debates. We see, you know, a great debate between re Republicans and Democrats, even over how much aid the government should provide the states in the wake of the pandemic, with Republicans wishing to provide states with less aid and Democrats looking to help out a little bit more. When you look at uh, local and state government agencies, one of the reasons why Republicans tend to favor localism is you can even look at it from a perspective of Metuchen. You look at the decisions here in our, our own school district. The local Board of Education probably knows quite a bit more about what is important in Metuchen and the needs of the district than, let's say, the state government in New Jersey. And then you take it a level higher. And then, of course, the federal government dealing with 330 million Americans and school districts across the country and millions of students. They, of course, know far less about Metuchen than even New Jersey. And of course, Metuchen would know quite a bit more. And that's kind of the rationale. Four, what assumptions did Hoover have about the people impacted or affected by the depression and the forces that caused the depression? So Hoover went from the general perspective, if it was a temporary downward trend of the economy, he wrongfully assumed the economic problems over the course of time would work itself out. He relied too much on the efforts of private citizens, businesses, and local agencies and governments to make the right changes. Often in times of crisis, you need more guidance from the federal government, and Hoover was not really providing that guidance for uh, the country at that point in time. A lot of people were disappointed with the reactions of the Hoover administration. Sometimes conservatives come with a top-down approach so when you look here at number five, why did Hoover prefer to give money to railroads, banks, and big businesses rather than individual citizens? He believed direct relief to individual citizens could create a dependency society in which citizens became too reliant on government assistance. The general idea is if you're receiving government assistance, let's say it's a weekly check, unemployment check, whatever it might be, that might decrease your motivation to go out and look for a job on your own. So over the course of time, he believed more and more citizens would kind of become content relying on the government opposed to making decisions and kind of better in their situation themselves. By aiding big businesses and railroads and banks, his hope was to stabilize the economy from the top-down approach that I alluded to before. Okay. 
Six, how did uh, supply side or trickle down economics impact the economy and help it to expand? Well, supply side economics or trickle down economics is kind of an economic philosophy. And once again, we're looking at generalizations here. And when you look at this, this is the overall philosophy of the conservative or Republican Party. The belief of Hoover, as well as most conservatives or Republicans, is that if the government cuts taxes for all citizens, which of course includes the wealthiest citizens within society, that those businesses would then expand. And if they expand, this could create jobs. And if people had jobs, the benefits could trickle down to all areas of the economy. As I mentioned, this has been, been the signature financial policy of the modern day Republican Party, uh, President Trump, former presidents George W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, Ronald Reagan, all Republican presidents, all of whom advocated this very similar basic economic philosophy. And I have a little illustration here that can kind of help you maybe to visualize this a little bit more. So if you look here, the general idea is that if the rich gain more wealth and you can see the arrows going down, they can invest in businesses and create more jobs. If there's more jobs, there'll be more spending in the economy. And then the very lower level there, the pyramid, lower skilled workers maybe will get a higher pay if more jobs are available. Increased tax revenues, because the philosophy would be, if you just look at it mathematically, let's say you have 100 million people in the workforce, and then you have 20 million people collecting unemployment. Well, if you had 120 million people working, even at a lower tax rate, if you had 20 million or more than 20% more people paying taxes, the overall amount of money into the government treasury would be higher, even at a lower tax rate. So instead of, let's say, paying 25% of your salary into the treasury, you pay 20%, but if you have many, many more people working, the belief would be it would actually increase tax revenues for the federal government. And then the multiplier effect of increased spending, more and more people have money in their pockets, they go out to dinner, they go out and buy stuff, they go to the movies, to the theater, to sporting events, and all that, in theory, would help the economy. And I say theory because, you know, like any other economic philosophy, you know, some would read uh, communism and the e economic philosophy of that and shared wealth. And you can kind of look at that and say, hey, that sounds pretty good. And just like this can possibly sound good for, for some, but whether or not it works out that way in practice is quite a bit different than what it might look like on paper. Now, when you look at Herbert Hoover and any president, one of the things they sometimes do is they invest in what are called public works projects. A public works project is the federally government funded project to build something for the greater good within society. Uh, during Hoover's presidency, perhaps the biggest and most significant accomplishment he had was the constructions of the Boulder Dam and the Hoover Dam. Uh, when you look here at the photos of the Hoover Dam, you can see how large it is, what a structure it is. It, uh, it holds back the Colorado River, and it really provides a lot of the drinking water to the uh, major parts of the West Coast, you know, parts of Arizona and California and Nevada. So those are all long-lasting accomplishments you know, from this era in history. And as we move forward into the Roosevelt administration, we'll see many other projects that were constructed during Roosevelt's presidency. So when you look here at the blame game, you know, often you blame the leader for issues within society, regardless of what the problem might be or crisis or pandemic. You often point right back to the leader and you kind of say, well, the buck kind of stops with the leader. The responsibility ultimately for the country falls on the uh, presidency and the cabinet of advisors. So many blame, blamed Hoover and his lack of action or his inaction to help adjust to the changing economic conditions. Others blame capitalism itself. So sometimes you can even blame the system of government, not just the head of the government in regard to the problems within society. And that's when we began to see a lot of alternative ideas in regard to the economy move, moving forward. Socialism and communism or even fascism. These are all I ideologies that became more and more popular during the 1930s and even in the 1920s as fascism came to Italy in 1922. Fascism hits and takes control in Germany in 1933. 
uh, fascism in Spain in 1936. You have communism already in the large country of Russia. Communism would spread in the 1940s to China, eventually to Cuba, Vietnam, Korea. So you're going to see you know, these different ideologies or philosophies for government and economic systems begin to spread. And some in America began to cry out for some of these dramatic changes as well. So in times of desperation, citizens are often attracted to more extreme measures. During the Depression, many Americans suggested a change to communism or even fascism as a potential solution for the nation's economic woes. Americans argued in a communist society, it could create a more equitable America with wealth distributed more evenly amongst all aspects of society. Also during this period of time, there were those who began to request to the government either assistance or in the case here, we had uh, literally millions of World War I veterans and they had been promised because of their service in the military a bonus. And this bonus was designed to be paid in 1945, but because many of these American heroes and soldiers from uh, the Great War, World War I, were struggling financially. They made a request to the government that their bonuses be paid early opposed to waiting until 1945. So they weren't necessarily looking for a handout or a freebie or something from the government. They just wanted what they were owed a little bit early. The government refused. There was a lot of lobbying in Congress. In 1932, 20,000 veterans camped out in Washington, D.C. in large numbers in hopes of influencing Congress. Kind of their own protest and they basically put tents and things like that there. Hoover did not react very well to the bonus army. After Congress voted, voted against awarding the bonuses, a riot broke out in July of 1932. Hoover took dramatic action to break up the protesters, removing forcibly the bonus army, these heroes from Washington, D.C., he sent in General Douglas MacArthur, who's going to be a huge hit, uh, figure in history moving forward. He was ordered to clear the bonus army from the city. Macar uh, MacArthur was quoted as stating that he felt that D.C. and the control of the government was in jeopardy. So he strongly supported Hoover's stance against the uh, bonus army marchers. And then Americans watched in horror as photos in the newspapers and radio reports broke of the violence against our former uh, soldiers are people who defended our country and def defended freedom across the globe. And eventually a fully armed force pushed the older and some defenseless veterans out of the city. And you can see the two different photographs here, one on the left uh, illustrating some of the violence and on the right, the sheer number of people who marched in DC at that time. The excessive force against American veterans and heroes who had put their lives on the line for the country did not play very well in the media. It only further solidified America's negative opinion towards Hoover. Thirteen lists four reasons why Hoover had very little hope of winning re-election in 1932 versus Democratic challenger Franklin Roosevelt. Well, when you have unemployment at 25%, the easy thing to say is, can it get any worse? And as a result, most Americans felt like it could not get any worse by electing Franklin Roosevelt. So in their minds, going to him was a good choice. Now, many Americans have lost their lifetime savings after the bank failures. Many Americans were homeless. Hunger hit America, as we had looked in previously. Bread lines, soup kitchens were very prevalent throughout in American cities. When you look at Roosevelt's background and experiences, he's from New York State, upper class upbringing, attended very prestigious schools. He believed in service to his country. He married Eleanor Roosevelt, who is actually his distant cousin. So kind of an interesting marriage ceremony there. So if you've been to a, a wedding, they said, Eleanor Roosevelt, do you take Franklin Roosevelt to be your husband? So I guess a bonus for Eleanor Roosevelt, was she didn't have to change her name on any of her documents and uh, you know, her, her towels, which had her initials on it, uh, they stayed the same as well. So everything worked kind of smoothly for her from that perspective by marrying her cousin. And she was also the niece of Teddy Roosevelt. So you saw the Roosevelt family kind of linked together here. He served as a New York State Senator, he Assistant Secretary of the Navy under President Wilson, the vice presidential nominee on a losing ticket in 1920. 
He contracted polio, unfortunately, in 1921, and eventually this would take away his ability to use his legs. And he was the governor of New York State in 1928. So very broad resume, very well qualified. He was the 32nd president of the United States, elected in 1932. So uh, pretty interesting there that that lines up. Fifteen, what did uh, President Hoover mean when he said the 1932 election was a contest between two philosophies on government? Well, we kind of looked at some of the differences between Republicans and Democrats. Hoover, a traditional conservative Republican, uh, favored government restraint, laissez-faire economics or trickle-down economics, cutting taxes for all. FDR was a liberal Democrat, argued the economy needed government action and direct relief to those who were struggling. He came away with the general idea that it's a responsibility of the government to help all citizens in need. How was Franklin Roosevelt's approach to fighting the Depression much different from Hoover's? FDR was willing to take a risk. So sometimes you need to be able to take a risk and even have some failures in order to come up with the best approach. He had what was called a trial and error approach. Implement one program. If it's helpful and successful, then fine. If not, scrap it and try another one. So basically try, try, and try again. He stated it was a role of the government to do all it could to help Americans. The hands-off free market approach, Hoover, uh, which has become the default uh perspective of the Republican Party. He was deeply criti uh, criticized for that. Uh, so Republicans are a little bit more hands off. Democrats a little bit more proactive with direct relief. And there would be some of the uh, big differences between the two. When you look at the final results of the 1932 election, you had a situation where uh, Franklin Roosevelt won an overwhelming victory, pushing close to 60% of the vote nearly 90% of the electoral votes. These few that Hoover won were in the New England region and Pennsylvania. So basically won New England and Pennsylvania, and that's pretty much it. And so Hoover's out, Roosevelt's in, and we're gonna see a complete change in the direction of the country in regard to, uh, the, I guess, the approach to the Great Depression. After you, Franklin Roosevelt won the victory in 1932. When was he sworn in? And how did Americans feel about this delay? Well, March 4th, 1933 is when they had to wait. So for the entire history of our country, from the establishment of the first president with Washington through the first Roosevelt administration, the president was sworn in on March 4th. So you had a what is called a lame duck period of time from November through March. It was for transitional purposes to give time to get staff members and get everything vetted and kind of put in place so you can take over, you know, fully staffed and ready to go. But at this point in time, Americans just wanted Hoover out and Roosevelt in. So shortly after uh, Roosevelt's election, the Constitution was amended. So moving forward in history, election day is January 20th. So on January 20th, 2021, that'll be inauguration day for the next uh, presidency. So what uh, Roosevelt did is he put together what is called a brain trust. A brain trust is a group of advisors. And in a time of crisis, Roosevelt wanted the strongest leaders in the country, top economic minds, college professors, economists. He didn't care if they were Republicans, Democrats, moderates, Americans, and you know, foreigners, anybody who had good ideas is what he wanted. So ideas over, you know, political loyalty, you know, sometimes a, sign of a strong leader is somebody who's willing to put diverse opinions around them. You know, weak leaders tend to want yes people, people who would just agree with everything they say, and they're maybe not confident enough in their own leadership to take some criticism. So in the case of Roosevelt, he of course wanted diverse opinions. And so he had a very strong cabinet. So his brain trust included his presidential cabinet as well as other advisors he brought in. So we see the little visual there. He surrounded himself with brilliant social, economic, and political thinkers as advisors to help develop strategies to pull the nation out of the depression. Uh, many of the ideas came from a British economist. So as I mentioned, not necessarily have to be from the United States to have ideas. John Maynard Kenneth. 
Uh, interesting, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau was the first Jewish uh, cabinet member, so kind of a barrier broken there as we kind of diversify. Also, Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins, a female cabinet member. Uh, so that was another milestone there. So a lot of positive things coming out, even out of the positions that he chose. So when we look at Roosevelt's programs, the New Deal are the programs that he's going to push forward during his run for the presidency. He promised a series of New Deal programs to help all Americans. And he said he would really get up and running as fast as possible. And he promised to put his programs into effect within the first 100 days in his office, 100 days in the presidency. So basically from you know March 4th to maybe June 14th or so, that was kind of the window of the first 100 days where he really wanted to act proactively to help out Americans. And in that short window, 100 days, he passed 15 brand new programs to help out the country. And ever since Franklin Roosevelt, we often look at presidents and the precedents they established. In the case of Roosevelt, he established the precedent of presidents being evaluated after 100 days in office. And that's what we do even with the new president. We see what they're able to do during those first 100 days. 20, why was the panic that caused the run on banks one of the top priorities of the Roosevelt administration? But you can even think logically your own self. The banking industry is the foundation of our American economy. And as such, having a strong banking system was key or essential to um, our country. Banks provide loans. They keep your money safe. Uh, this helps to spur economic activity. All this is a positive aspect of the economy. 21, how did the emergency banking bill help repair the broken banking system? This gave the president broad powers to regulate and stabilize the banking system. FDR declared a four-day bank holiday in which all banks were closed. All those banks that were deemed solvent means strong enough with enough deposits on hand to reopen were allowed to reopen. Those which did not have deposits had to remain closed. This helped to calm fears and slowed the run on the banks. Perhaps the most important thing to come out of the banking reform bill was the FDIC. This is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. You can see the initial seal from 1933 on the left. The right side is a contemporary one. You would actually see this posted somewhere in the bank that you go to. Initially, when the banking uh, bill was passed, it insured deposits up to $5,000. This means that Every dollar you had in the bank up to $5,000, if the bank closed, the federal government would give you the money back, kind of in an insurance policy. Today, that number is increased to $250,000, hence the number on the FDIC placard there on the right side of the photograph. So basically today, let's say uh, you get a job out of college or whatever it might be, you're making a lot of money, you save up money. So if you have $300,000 in a bank, and the bank went out of business, the government would write you out a check for $250,000. So you would lose $50,000. So that's why if you, you know, wealthy people within society, they diversify where their money goes. A lot of times they don't even keep it in banks, they invest in other options. But generally speaking, if you had more than $250,000, you would have to have money, let's say in TD Bank and maybe Bank of America, because each individual bank is insured up to $250,000. So you'd have to spread the risk amongst different banks. What Roosevelt did too during this period of time that was really helpful is he communicated with the American public. He gave radio addresses on a regular basis. These were called his fireside chats. You can see a photograph there of Roosevelt. Obviously, they're just hearing the radio chats. It's a photo, like a photo op there. They're not seeing Roosevelt physically on TV because TV doesn't exist yet. So basically, Americans would sit around their fireplace, have the radio on top of the mantle, and they would listen to Roosevelt speak to the new programs of the time. This gave Americans much more confidence in the American presidency and in, in the country. Another important program passed by Roosevelt was the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Uh, the goals and advantage and disadvantages of this act. Well, first of all, farmers have been struggling for a long period of time, so this helped to stabilize the farm industry. Farmers had overproduced their crops for a long period of time, so the supply was too great and prices had collapsed. So what the AAA did is it actually paid farmers to grow less, destroy crops, kill livestock, cut back on the overall supply. 
once the supply is much lower, then naturally the prices would go up. So it was basically what we call farm subsidies, kind of paying them to grow less. Now, even though it seems like Roosevelt was doing a really great job and most historians believe that he did, it does not necessarily mean that all Americans loved what he was doing. So there were some criticisms of Roosevelt's New Deal programs, basically from both sides, from both conservatives, as well as those who are more liberal than Roosevelt. Conservatives felt FDR had gone too far, running up huge federal deficits, making citizens too dependent on the government. Other conservatives felt the United States was slowly drifting towards a communist government. Liberals, on the other hand, were critical because they felt we had not gone far enough. They argued that unemployment rates were still too high and many Americans were still living in poverty. Some specific critics, Dr. Francis Townsend, he proposed an interesting idea to uh, help the struggling economy. He proposed a plan to aid older Americans, 60 and older. He called for a government to pay seniors $200 a month to help seniors and also to help stimulate the economy because a requirement for the $200 check per month was that you would have to spend a certain amount of that money each month in the economy. And this is very similar to a program that Roosevelt's going to implement not long thereafter, which is Social Security, which is kind of a foundation principle and economic idea that helps seniors today. Charles Coughlin, uh, he turned on Franklin Roosevelt. He was a priest and he spoke, uh, had a radio program addressing some of his concerns. He felt FDR was not going far enough to help citizens. He called the New Deal the raw deal. He, pro he proposed the nationalization of all industry. So basically he was a you know, hardcore you know, communist or socialist there. And then the final critic was the Kingfish himself. Huey Long, he was from Louisiana. He had served a long time as governor and a senator from there. FDR viewed Long as a threat based on evidence from a 1935 poll that indicated that if Long ran against Roosevelt for the presidency in 1936, he could potentially take away more than 4 million votes. Even if Roosevelt was a Democratic nominee and uh, Huey Long ran as an independent or a liberal or a progressive, his votes that he pulled away from the president could potentially cost him the election. Huey Long, as you see pictured there, nicknamed the Kingfish, was a seasoned politician. He advocated a share our wealth program that guaranteed free higher education, vocational training, pensions, or like basically social security for the elderly, veterans benefit and health care, a yearly stipend for all families earning less than one third the national average. So it's basically a guaranteed national floor income, meaning everybody would have enough for a home, a car, a radio, and ordinary conveniences. And we see some of this um, in more contemporary society too. I think Andrew Yang, when he ran for the Democratic nomination, had a similar idea. Then the lesson reflection. Why was the fact that Roosevelt faced criticism from both the left and the right an indication he was making strong decisions? Well, if only if only one end of the political spectrum is supporting you, then you're probably just passing and proposing ideas that your party agrees on. However, if you're compromising, taking the best ideas from both political parties, this is the best way to govern. You know, you know, all Democratic ideas and all Republican ideas are not all good or bad. There's kind of a mix on both sides. And those who are willing to compromise and find the best approach and the best, I guess, traits of each side are probably the ones who are best uh, positioned to lead our country. You know, hopefully you enjoyed our discussion here of the two sides of the Depression, two different approaches, the conservative approach from President Hoover and then the New Deal and the more liberal approach from Franklin Roosevelt. Until next time, Mr. Clark is out.